So good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I hope everyone is well where they are. I can see we have quite a number of people that have joined in. Um, we have uh, four minutes past uh, the three p.m. time that we had agreed to start. Allow me to just give one or two more minutes to the rest of us that are about to join us. And uh, I'll, 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 I'll introduce our session speakers and uh, what the session is about today. So allow me two minutes. Um, but I want to thank all of you that have made it here on time. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so I think uh, uh, two minutes are up. So good afternoon once again. Uh, I hope I can be heard. Could I have confirmation that I can be heard? I know we are struggling with the internet in some of the places. Can I be heard? Okay, thank you very much. So i um, thrilled to see such a diverse group of participants that are joining us today. And uh, I really want to take this moment to thank you. And uh, your commitment to this important conversation is uh, truly commendable. Uh, today we are gathering in a fairly shared objective to really explore the challenges and opportunities that are surrounding household air pollution and we know its profound impact on our health, environment, and, the, and, and, and our climate. So I, I believe that this session is going to provide us uh, a platform uh, for some in-depth discussion and insights from our distinguished speakers. Um, we are privileged today to to have uh, 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 in the next one hour uh, great speakers that are going to provide uh, uh, their wealth of experience or share their wealth of experience. Uh, and we have three speakers. Uh, and uh, after the speakers are presented, uh, their, their, their wealth of experience, uh, we shall be able to interact with them and uh, the interaction could actually be ongoing as you're listening uh, online. We shall have uh, our, 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 our platform where we are going to be putting questions as we go along. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we shall have a session where we shall be, uh, we shall be talking to each other uh, after the presentations have, made, have been made. So we are delighted to have
Uh, okay, Ivan, are you there? Sorry, I, I think it's the internet. Um, like I was saying earlier, we are really struggling with the internet in some of our places, but hopefully the interruptions won't be as many. Um, so like I was saying earlier, um, uh, we have, uh, yes, I am back. So we have uh, Professor Pope who's going to take us uh, uh, amongst the speakers. Uh, he has a wealth of experience uh, of more than 20 years researching the health, gender, environment, and climate impacts from reliance on polluting sources of uh, household energy in low and middle income countries and prevention strategies through clean cooking technologies and fuels. Uh, Professor Pope uh, currently uh, works uh, directly, uh, he currently directs the UK National Institute of Health and Care Research, that is NIHR, Clean Air Africa Global Health Research Unit. Um, we are also delighted to have with us uh, another colleague, another speaker, by the names of uh, Nancy Chebichi. Uh, Nancy is a researcher at uh, Kemri, that's Kenya Medical Research Institute, and is dedicated to addressing the significant global health concern of household, household air pollution with a focus on communities empowerment for health and sustainability. Nancy coordinates uh, health system strengthening and capacity building within NIHR Global Health Research Unit, that's Clean, Care, Clean Air Africa. She has years of experience in developing, training and delivering a community health education on household air pollution and uh, digitizing of uh, this training. She has coordinated a training of community health promoters in different countries or counties across Kenya, and currently is working to leverage on community existing structures towards a wider reach with the health messages to address uh, household air pollution uh, associated with health, associated health, gender, environment, and uh, climate impacts. I hope I am still being heard. Uh, I have to, to, to take note of that. Uh, so the last speaker that we have is uh, one of our own, uh, Professor uh, Bruce Cherenga. Professor Bruce Cherenga is uh, uh, known to most of us. Uh, Professor Bruce Cherenga is uh, the director of the Macquarie University Lung Institute and is a chief uh, uh, research scientist at uh, Macquarie University Lung Institute. He's an associate professor of pulmonary medicine in the Department of Medicine, uh, Macquarie University, and uh, has a, a good number of years, immense experience in pulmonary health particularly in uh, air pollution. And some of the studies that uh, Professor Bruce Chirenga has been involved in have actually set the ball rolling uh, for uh, air pollution in, in Uganda and in Africa largely. So as you can see, we really have uh, a vast, uh, uh, we have representation from all over the region and largely all over the world. So I want to, um, uh invite our first presenter uh so that uh, he can take on the platform and give us his first presentation so professor pop uh please uh the microphone is over to you thank you ivan uh, can you hear me okay am i coming across all right yes we can hear you perfect okay well thank you for that introduction and i'm very pleased to be uh, speaking first on behalf of our Clean Air Africa Global Health Research Unit. It's a partnership between the University of Liverpool, uh, Kemery, um, uh, that's the Kenya uh, Med Medical Research Institute, uh, and Moy 
University in Kenya, the University of Dar es Salaam uh, in uh, Tanzania, and the Rwanda Biomedical Center, um, this is in Rwanda, and to our general hospital from Cameroon, and of course, uh, our hosts and partners, the Makarere Lung Institute. So Cleaner Africa is conducting research to address the health burden from household air pollution in sub-Saharan Africa, with a focus on scale of clean household energy. So I've been asked to how it represents um, being the killer in the kitchen. So my, my presentation is going to be focused on three areas. Firstly, what's the problem? Um, reliance on polluting fuels for household energy, uh, particularly a problem for the um, and how that relates to health effects and disease burden. And also um, what needs to be done so from uh, developing WHO air quality guidelines, which are uh, University of Liverpool were involved in steering, to now implementing strategies through clean energy. And I'm going to draw on three uh, pieces of research from us. Uh, uh, three papers that have been published, in, two in the Lancet and one in environmental research letters, that show how research informs our strategy uh, moving forward. Okay, so the problem. Uh, problems, uh, reliance on solid fuels and kerosene uh, for uh, household energy, heating and, and lighting homes. Uh, globally, 3 billion people rely on these fuels uh, around it. And you can see from this, this map here that uh, uh, it's by far uh, the most problem in low middle income countries, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, parts of Latin America, but there's a disproportionate burden uh, within the Sub-Saharan African region. Uh, with more than 85% of the population relying on these polluting fuels. That's 900 million people. Cleaner Africa has five focus countries, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Cameroon, and Rwanda, all with substantially high proportions of the population relying on these fuels. So what does that mean? Well, <clears throat> as well as impacts on health, there are substantial impacts on gender, and impacts on children. Uh, time, personal safety, and economic development from reliance on having to collect wood fuel for, uh, for cooking, which puts women at a, uh, a risk of uh, violence and uh, impacts the time that for, for their educations. And I think uh, most people know that it's women and children that will bear the brunt of reliance on the, on, um, the solid fuels. There are substantial impacts on climate, both through deforestation, but also through emissions of uh, short-term climate forcing uh, uh, products of incomplete combustion, for example, methane and black carbon, uh, which substantially contributes uh, to uh, global warming. The health problem from reliance on these fuels concerns uh, emissions of health damaging uh, PIPs products of com incomplete combustion, like particulate matter, carbon monoxide, and nitrous oxide, SO2, and other particles, chemicals, and gases um, that are, are released when they're burned, typically in inefficient stoves. Uh, exactly the same health risks as you'd find in smoking uh, tobacco. Obviously, it's another form of uh, burned biomass. And it's women and children who are the most exposed due to domestic uh, tasks associated with cooking. Um, to give you an indication of the, uh, the risk, uh, WHO have a guideline level, and I'll return to this uh, later in the presentation, of five micrograms per metre cubed for uh, PM2.5. I'll explain what that means, but you can see that levels in the home are more than 100 times uh, the uh, guideline level for health uh, from the WHO. In fact, it's been estimated that use of a, a traditional open fire with wood and charcoal and burning so you can imagine the experience. There are three pollutants that particularly are damaging and we're going to 0.5. These are very, very small particles that 
uh, a pretty deep into the lungs, uh, they're absorbed into the bloodstream. So as well as causing uh, respiratory illness, like COPD and pneumonia, uh, they can cause systemic effects like uh, ischemic heart disease and also uh, brain uh, effects like stroke. Um, carbon monoxide is a, an odorless and colorless gas um, and is associated with reduced oxygen deliberately uh, causing oxidative stress and poisoning, particularly uh, damaging uh, or pregnant women or fetus. Um, also, uh, within many instances of carbon monoxide poisoning that lead to death. Uh, and finally, the chemicals known as polyaromatic hydrocarbons are known to have carcinogenic properties uh, and are associated uh, with uh, lung cancer and cancer of the upper airways, and probably uh, a lot of other cancers which haven't been documented effectively yet. So there's conclusive evidence of a causal association between particles and a number of health problems. Um, and these are established um, epidemiological evidence and parallel evidence, so collected from ambient air and uh, uh, environmental tobacco smoke, um, uh, animal studies, mechanistic studies. So the evidence has been very carefully appraised to judge that there's a causal relationship. And there are these uh, eight key outcomes that are now included in the global pneumonia, ischemic heart disease, lung cancer, diabetes, low birth weight, preterm birth, and tuberculosis. So all of those conditions can now be assessed in calculations of the burden of disease to work out what um, the uh, overall uh, premature much more mortality burden, but also morbidity burden is uh, for um, household air pollution. Um, globally, but also at, uh, at and I was talking about having metrically evidence, which is not a judge of causality. I just thought I'd show um, a, a paper that's been published by the University of Liverpool that focuses on um, uh, 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 childhood pneumonia. So, the front of strep pneumonia is a step in the development of pneumococcal pneumonia. And we the first ever study to examine the association uh, between effective measured exposure to PM2.5. So we were uh, using uh, micro pen monitors to, to work out what the actual exposure was for children. Um, and we also took patient practical uh, swabs um, for, for the children taking part in the study uh, to uh, assess uh, in the children under the age of six months. Very high prevalence uh, allowing Eighty-six uh, percent of children had uh, uh, presence of strep. Like, we carried out an exposure response anal analysis and found a significant dose response relationship. So, such uh, a one unit increase in decile, so um, to the groups of the X point five, the groups of ten groups, one unit found significantly increased the risk of. Uh, strep pneumonia uh, carriage by 10%. And it was uh, uh, an adjusted relationship. Uh, and we could conclude that there was evidence of a mechanistic association between exposure to household air pollution and childhood pneumonia. So the epidemiological evidence was there already. We could find the association. But this was providing an explanation of the plausibility necessary for the burden of disease. So by calculating the excess deaths and what we call disability adjusted uh, life years, so these are years in, in with disability that's associated with exposure to household air pollution, we can work out the burden. And so the latest data from the Global Burden of Disease finds that 2.3 million people each year die prematurely from diseases that are related to household air pollution caused by uh, reliance on solid fuels and kerosene. 2.3 million deaths. And that's 4% of all deaths globally. And there's a huge uh, uh, morbidity burden, 91.4 million dallies, uh, about 4% of um, all uh, morbidity. But that's globally. So 
we return to the map of reliance on solid fuels, and we said that soft Saharan Africa bears a disproportionate burden in terms of this um, uh, exposure, in terms of this usage, we can see that there's almost 684,000 deaths each year um, in the soft Saharan African region, and that's almost 10% of total mortality. And we can see that across all of our focus countries for clean air Africa. Um, in fact, uh, for the five focus countries we're working with, uh, the overall mortality is between 6 and 11%. So what to do? Well, I said the University of Liverpool Steer Development of WHO Air Quality Guidelines. Well, these were published in 2014. So part of the master because we knew that was uh, also associated with those health outcomes. There needs to be achieved to health benefit. And you can see what we're present here. Uh, for lower middle income, the interim target level was set 35 micrograms per meter cubed. Recognizing the transition to um, cleaner energy was going to take a longer time period. The other uh, thing to note from the recommendations from WHO quality guidelines is this push for policies um, designed to transition populations to truly clean fuels. And the, in the absence of truly clean fuels, uh, to um, transition to uh, cleaner technologies. I'm sorry, it's a bit of a busy slide, but we wanted to look at of the options that are available to clean, which is most effective in towards that interim target uh, set by WHO. Uh, and this slide here shows a systematic review and meta analysis that looked at all the evidence. Different interventions for, for clean cooking. We found that only ethanol, LPG, and electricity reached levels that were close to the interim target one level. And in fact, whilst exposure was reduced uh, significantly for improved cook stoves, including the most advanced gasifier stoves, levels were not getting anywhere near the interim target one level. We concluded from that burning biomass more cleanly improved cook stoves does not reach the WHO target. So this slide here shows uh, an exposure response curve for child pneumonia. On the x-axis, we have increasing PM2.5 exposure, so exposure to household air pollution. On the y-axis, we have increasing relative risk for childhood pneumonia. And the red line is the exposure response curve. So as exposure increases, so does the risk of childhood pneumonia. It's a non-linear relationship. So to achieve significant health benefit, we need to get levels at or near the interim target one level set by the WHO. So levels that are very, very low. And this, these curves are very important. So this curve is typical of the other health outcomes that are associated with the burden of disease, all except uh, lung cancer, which is a linear relationship. So we have a, a cook stove. Uh, it's a Czech Kube stove in Kenya, and we can see that levels are about 500 micrograms per meter cubed. Uh, an intervention uh, using a gasifier stove, in this case a, a pellet stove, will halve the uh, exposure, halve the concentrations of PM2.5, so reduce them by quite a lot. But because of the nonlinear relationship of the exposure response curve, it has very little impact on the overall relative risk. In fact, it's going from about three to more than 2.5. So very small change in risk. And to really impact on that risk, we would need to get down to levels close to like, interim target one level. And you can see here uh, concentrations that we observe for using LPG, a truly clean fuel, and that has a dramatic impact on the overall risk. So the conclusion here is that it's, uh, Burning biomass more cleanly should not be recommended as a health solution. And there's a real need to invest time, effort, money into helping populations transition to truly clean LPG or electricity. Uh, we uh, at Cleaner Africa uh, recommend what we call a twin track approach. So promotion of LPG in the short to medium term has that instant health gain. It's it's freely available. It doesn't require an infrastructure. People want to use it. It can be scaled effectively. Um, there's plenty of literature that demonstrates that. Um, but when we're thinking about the sustainable development goal targets of 2030, 
specifically SDG 7, which is universal access to clean modern energy. It's really a fuel that, uh, one of the only fuels that can uh, be scaled in, uh, in, in a, a very effective way. E-cooking has a place, and e-cooking is receiving uh, increasing attention and should also be looked at in the same time up to 2030. But realistically, for e-cooking to become a viable, scalable option, uh, we're looking at a, a net zero time frame of 2050. So what happens to those 23,000 deaths each year in, in uh, Uganda or the 650,000 deaths overall in the sub-Saharan Africa re region each year? Well, we need to really consider how to quickly scale uh, adoption of clean fuels. Ethanol and biogas are, are inter interesting options for uh, certain contexts, should be part of the, uh, the picture, but again, to achieve that substantial scale, um, they, they can only be uh, yeah, uh, 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 part, of the, part of the mix. There's evidence that's coming out that um, uh, LPG might not be um, necessarily beneficial for health in high-income countries, well, we've conducted a, a substantial systematic re review and meta-analysis contrasting cooking with gas or LPG, gaseous fuels, both to polluting fuels, but also to electricity. So what are the health impacts from switching to um, gas? And then what are the health impacts from comparing that to electricity? You can see in this table here that we looked at a range of health outcomes, including asthma, pneumonia, chronic lung disease, adverse pregnancy outcomes and respiratory symptoms. The majority were found to have a, a, a large positive impact on health when compared to polluting fuels. And compared to electricity, there was less information, but only two outcomes were found to have a slight increase in risk, childhood pneumonia and COPD. Very important messages when we're thinking about what um, is the overall recommendation for the transition to clean, in lower middle income countries. So we concluded from this review, which has just been published this week, that uh, uh, gas um, LPG is an important transitional option for health in countries where access to reliable electricity supply from cook for cooking or heating isn't feasible in the near term. And I'm just gonna finish with this slide here, which is really driving the work of Clean Air Africa in terms of its research. And, um, and health system strengthening. Um, SDG seven is only four, five uh, years away, five, six years away. <laughs> um, and it, we're a long way away from achieving universal access for uh, clean cooking. In fact, more than 60% of Sub-Saharan Africa are likely to be without access to clean cooking fuel by 2030 on current trends. So it's a substantial uh, concern and needs a lot of attention from all actors in the clean cooking space. Thank you. So to recap on my very brief presentation, um, I've covered what uh, the reliance on solid fuels and kerosene outside energy means to uh, sub-Saharan Africa and why it's a public health and environmental issue that needs to addressing. I've described how it's associated with uh, disease burden and health impacts. Um, I presented the WHA quality guidelines. I really recommend uh, 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 getting hold of those and reading them. There's a huge amount of um, uh, systematic, systematic analysis of the literature in development of those guidelines. Um, I've presented evidence on why improved cook stoves uh, are not uh, the answer for achieving the health gain from transition to clean cooking. And I indicate why LPG is likely to be the most scalable option in sub-Saharan Africa in the short to medium term for health gain. So uh, uh, that's over from me. Uh, very happy to uh, answer any questions, but also you'll find my email address in the first slide. So do feel free to reach out if you have any questions or comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Pope, for that uh, enlightening presentation. Uh, I think you've set the uh, ball rolling, uh, talking to us about the problem statement and the role of clean cooking uh, perspectives from the Clean Air Africa. Now, uh, I think in order to save some time, let's uh, first hear from our next presenter, uh, Nancy, 
and, and then we shall hear from Professor Bruce, and after that we shall have our questions all together. Keep your questions coming into the chat. Uh, we shall uh, look at them uh, at the end of the two presentations coming up. Nancy, over to you. We are having some yeah. small technical issues. It's all right. It's understandable. Okay. Yes. So, uh, to bring us to perspective is that we can research and the aim of doing this research is to be able to inform strategies and how best do we implement them or how best do we Based on one research, two the WHO guidelines, three uh, there was also evidence from the community in terms of development. So this model has the following new needs. So this model uh, is a typical model for community health power, which is uh, in a way that it will take care of both. The community health uh, as community health assistants and the healthcare workers who are public health officers, environmental health, uh, community health nurses, and clinicians that work at the primary level of primary health care system. So unit one takes six to take through uh, the trainees through what what is the available housework in the context of baby solution and principles of intervention in health. So, uh, bringing the trainees to understanding of these systems, and then checking them to understanding the same thing, what they are using. How do you that not giving the evidence and the narration of what's happening, the training seeks to ensure that the households are able to understand that primary what the primary is available to them and how best can they then take care and implement this action. And lastly, we are all looking into SDG 7, SDG 13, all the uh, sustainable development goals. And for monitoring and evaluating and reporting on household air pollution has been even identified by WHO as a mandatory uh, requirement for countries to report on their status of their air every two years. And therefore, this particular module allows the trainees to go through what are the equipment that I use? How best do we then do this monitoring? And what are the available resources in country-specific context to ensure that this is able to inform not just uh, this, the health facilities, but also the national policies and the requirement at the international bodies. So this, tra this particular training is intense. It's a three-day training that targets to have interactive group works, guests, uh, case studies and role playing, and also most importantly is that they're able to go to the field to understand what's happening and how to then implement this health messaging at the community. So having noticed that household air pollution module was intense, 
And this cannot be directly translated to household members who are either the old, the young, the youth, and, vast, uh, and the diversity in the community. There was need to develop health promotion messaging tools. These tools, are, uh, as you can see from the picture, this was the team of community health promoters, the research team, the Ministry of Health teams, trying to understand what are the crucial materials that can be used as health messaging in the communities. These materials were then put together. You can see it's been laid down on the floor just to see what would you prefer, what would you not prefer, what message is best for the children, what would the old understand. And all these were put together to ensure that you are able to diversify the health promotion tools to also take care of the diversity in the community and households. So the result of that intensive health volunteers household air pollution job aids. This job aids was a blend of videos, photographs, animation, uh, this will also enable the community health promoter to have a similar health promotion process to be able to reference to research and evidence based health promotion messages. Uh, You are there. I am now. Can everyone hear me? Hello. Can yes, I? Yes, we can hear you, Nancy. Now. Uh, where did uh, where did I get lost? <laughs> before you introduced before you introduced uh, health and safety videos we were struggling to hear you my apologies and uh, so i will pro i will proceed to bring us to a conversation on the development of health promotion tools this, uh, uh, the target of developing this tool is always to ensure that we are developing tools that can suit, can best suit the diversity that's happening in the community. For instance, it will be the old, the young, the children, and different contexts. So as you can see from this uh, slide, Nancy, there was sorry, a team of research have... team. Okay, now we have the pictures. We okay. didn't have the slides, so it's okay. Go ahead. Yes. So I was describing how the, the health promotion messages was and the, and the rigorous process that lasted a year plus, which ensured that the health messages could cover the diversity in our communities from the children, the old, and different uh, individuals. And so this research, uh, these research, uh, these job aids were targeted to have diverse materials from pictures and videos to ensure that the videos were also QR coded within the printed materials for so individuals to download them at, at any point in time. And so these job aids, as you can see, they also assume the, uh, the, the process as they are within the manual. So the manual has four units. And health messages has to cover both first unit, the second unit, and the third unit. And so to ensure this, and it helps the community health promoter to be able to consistently communicate evidence-based information, and also to ensure that we are transition, uh, we are bringing them to an understanding and an awareness of the burden of.
I don't know whether it's me, but Nancy, I can't, I can't get you. Uh, are people getting Nancy? No. 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 Okay. Um, the control room, we can't hear you. Okay, so we can see the image, the, the, the slides, but we can't hear. I don't know if you're talking already. Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Apologies, uh, you can hear me now, I think. Uh, yes, I can hear you. Yes, so we to bring this to about close. Two minutes. Right. Yes. So to bring this to a close, I, I want to bring us to uh, a case study of, of, the, of the five years that we've been Pilot, uh, developing, piloting, training, and now we are looking at a rollout. We've had case um, studies from communities, and this particular one was from Langas in West Kenya. This uh, lady uh, had been cooking with charcoal, but then on monthly visits by the community health promoter, she was able to now associate the edicts, the coughs, and, and the wheezes that were happening among us, her children, herself, and her husband, to the cooking stove she had been using to prepare meals for this particular family. And so with that realization, she was able to ask, what do I do? And she transitioned to clean fuel. Um, and this was a success story of health education is, pow is a powerful tool to not just bring people to understand the health impacts, but also to transition them to clean energy. And lastly, We've been able to do a coverage of 20. So lastly, uh, what are the next steps in terms of scaling and ensuring that we have a, nat a national rollout? This is going to be a tool called uh, Teachbox. It has two of it has two options. That is the Teachbox Teach and Teachbox Learn. So the Teach application enables the delivery of a multimedia training in a classroom setting and even in environments with limited internet av availability. So the, how are we best going to digitalize when we know very well that it's, our contexts are diverse? So we'll have a tutor who would be in the, on the screen, who is a subject matter. In this context, will be a public health officer, will be a community health promotion officer, or would be a person who has been tasked with the role of training community health assistants.
I, I believe, colleagues, it's the internet that uh, is uh, disturbing the team in the, in the control room. Uh, let's give them a few minutes. They'll be here, a few seconds, actually. Sorry about that. I know there's a, I don't want to call it a global issue, but uh, something is going on in the internet in the last one or two days. <clears throat> You don't need to use the slides again. Just speak. Hello, Ivan. Hello, Nancy. Is it the slides that are that are taking our internet away? Right? Lost. Yeah, we, we, we lost you as you were trying to describe to us uh, the teach box, but uh, I, I imagine that's quite some distance behind. Yes, Ivan, thank you so much. Apologies for the disconnect. And uh, as I was complete, uh, I was coming to a close of the presentation. I was speaking into digitalizing trainings and processes in terms of health education to ensure that we are reaching a coverage of every part of the country in terms of messaging on household air pollution. So Teachbox is a platform that allows health education in, to be delivered in a standardized way. So in this way, we'll be avoiding situations whereby we've had to move uh, the subjects experts and also to pay them in per diems and also to ensure that security, their security is taken care of and uh, we have them deliver the training in the number of days. So Teachbox allows the flexibility scheduling training as per the community health promoters availability because they, they already have everything with them in the community. This has been bringing individuals from this. For example, moving individuals from the Ministry of Health in headquarters to the farthest part of the country may take a lot of investment in time as well as money. So moving forward, I will support of MLI. The reason we are visiting Uganda is because MLI um, Bacterial Institute will be taking the lead in piloting, but also to share the lessons to our partner countries as clean in Africa and see that then how best do we implement this and if there's anything to improve moving forward, that will be informed by research on Bacterial So thank you so much. We look forward to a great feedback in the best way to implement this from research from here. And we also look forward to working with the team here and also to Thank you very much, uh, Nancy. Um, we are sorry that you really struggled with the internet, but uh, some of the challenges are part of our, our daily living. So allow me to invite the third and final speaker of the day, uh, that is Associate uh, Professor Bruce Chirenga, uh, who's going to introduce us to the clinical perspectives and the need for action. Uh, in relation to household air pollution. Professor Chirenga, over to you. Can you hear us from the... Yes. I hope I can, you can see my slides. Yes, we can see your slides now. You can put in presenter okay. view. Oh, it's not? No, it's not in presenter view yet. I hope it is now. I think you may have to do it with uh, 
the way it is. It has not yet uh, gotten there, um, but oh. I guess you could, you could just go ahead and make a presentation. <clears throat> Looks like uh, yeah, I think so. Let me let me let me let me continue. So good afternoon. Uh, the subject has already been covered very well. Uh, so I actually have like a couple of slides to go through in the next few minutes. And um, uh, are the slides moving either? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. So um, uh, so this is uh, air pollution, which we have seen is a major public health problem. But generally, air pollution could refer to anything that is suspended in the air. So for many years, uh, the, some pollutants were classified as criteria pollutants because they had the highest impact on public health. And uh, these pollutants are listed there. Um, uh, as you can see, we have particulate matter, we have nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, sulfur, ozone, and lead. So these pollutants are the most dangerous. So the reason I repeat them here is to bring out the fact that these most dangerous pollutants have also been formed to be present in what we have known for many years as something safe, and that is uh, smoke from cooking. Uh, 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 we all grew up being having this exposure, and we did not consider this to be a problem. Indeed, uh, fire and humanity uh, have been great friends, and the, or the emergence of fire and smoke made sure that humans went ahead of other um, uh, organisms as the homo sapiens. Now, when we talk about indoor air pollution or household air pollution, we must know that it's a broader subject actually, where smoke or pollutants from cooking is just one of them. So for you, Kampala people, you have your garages very close to your house, vehicles idle there. You have um, uh, things that you use to clean your house. All these things could cause indoor air pollution, but that can be a discussion for another day. But just to bring out that this uh, cooking smoke or, uh, or household uh, smoke, is just one of them. So uh, Professor Dan has talked about this. This is just to emphasize for you that that smoke from cooking is not safe. It has all the dangerous pollutants, including uh, the polycyclic uh, hydrocarbons and in their tanks. Uh, this is just analysis of smoke from the fire. Uh, if we had time, we'll talk when do these pollutants come out of a burning wood. Uh, it depends on the stage of burning. Uh, there are three stages of burning when you light a piece of wood. Uh, initially, you will have uh, uh, the startup phase of the burning where you have a lot of carbon monoxide. Then you have the smoldering phase where you start to generate the particles and then where the fire is burning out and you start to get the pH. So these are the diseases associated with air pollution, which has been mentioned. And uh, these diseases, uh, mainly, if you look at them by organ system, you can have those ones in the respiratory system. Um, I don't want to repeat all. But we have other diseases where we start to, to, to appreciate the direct and the physical uh, health problems of burning, of using uh, uh, biomass, which is burns, because um, many people get burnt during the process. These are the acute health effects. 
Acute health effects are very, very important uh, when we talk about indoor air pollution. This means that even if you don't go ahead to develop asthma, to develop COPD, you could actually develop acute onset of wheezing, cough, uh, you can get uh, frame, you, know, you can start to get uh, heart problems where you get palpitations, headaches, um, uh, itching of the eyes. These are not so serious, but they can be a nuisance. Uh, in Uganda, people have just come from Christmas. Many people came back with the, these bad coughs. And of course, they were asking us, what could have happened? Is it COVID you picked in the village? It could be. But most likely, these are people from Kampala who have been exposed to some of these irritants in the villages. Most likely, biomass smoke, cooking on fire for the first time, children being exposed to this for the first time, and they get this uh, acute bronchitis, which we have been treating and continue to treat maybe for the next two weeks. These are the chronic effects. I want to point out that we have lung cancer here. Currently, we have a study that is looking at association of this uh, indoor air pollution and lung cancer, uh, uh, just to mention. So uh, this is a, has been mentioned again by, by Professor Dan, but this is to show the academics that there are actually significant association. This is a meta-analysis that actually shows that most of the, these diseases are on the right side of the line of no effect. Uh, this is a forest plot, as we call it. Uh, uh, and these are the other diseases. So this point also was mentioned already, that the effects of the uh, biomass smoke or indoor air pollution and these diseases is dose dependent. This is a very, very important point. Uh, which, as people in the uh, low-income countries and people addressing this, we need to appreciate they are dose-dependent, meaning that any reduction is good. Any reduction is what is good. This is the key point I'm making here. If I had the time, I would go through each of these diseases. Just to show you some work we did <coughs> about associating air pollution with children and lung function, we have published this work which showed that Actually, when you look at ambient air pollution, you will find that um, children in urban areas have less lung function. So when we come to the actual uh, subject that I'm supposed to talk about, uh, is what is the role of health workers in uh, clean cooking and safety? Um, a, a health worker interacts with the public health at three levels, at micro level, this is the uh, patient, a doctor-patient uh, doctor relationship in the consultation room. But you can be looking at the level of the community, but you can also look at a macro level where we are looking at issues of climate change and global. So uh, clinicians have this opportunity to promote behavior change. As we have seen in tobacco smoking, if clinicians talk about smoking, that message is uh, taken seriously by patients. Uh, actually, than what they have seen on TV or what they have seen on billboards. So this unique position, health workers need to use it to identify which patients are at risk. So how do you know that this patient who has come with asthma, probably this is from uh, household air pollution. How do you know that cancer is from household pollution. So uh, we need to talk about these risk factors, but we also need to screen people at risk for uh, uh, diseases associated with household air pollution. So who is at risk? Uh, one of the problems we faced studying uh, household air pollution that almost everyone is ubiquitously exposed. So when you tell uh, doctors who ask her in their clinical notes, are you exposed to biomass smoke? Then everyone is exposed. How, how, how do you tell he's at risk? So, as I told you, um, I, unfortunately, I didn't have time to expound it more, that these exposures cause disease in a dose 
response relationship. So we need to come up with metrics which show how much uh, exposure is being um, reported by your patients. So here is a, a sample questionnaire, it is small, but just know that some questionnaire has been met. Uh, this is from WHO Clinical Screening Tool for Air Pollution Assessment. And these are standardized questions you can ask your patients. For example, uh, here the question is asking, uh, uh, does your household burn solid fuels? So it's not enough to ask, are you using biomass smoke? There are follow-up questions when people say yes. Uh, how, what type of fuel, how often, and then you go down. That way you can be able to come up with an idea of the dose the patient is being exposed to. And these guys have published this questionnaire. It was the context of cardiovascular disease, but it is the same. It goes down to try to drill uh, what could be the exposure dose. So after you have found that people are exposed, then you need to start giving people messages, yeah? But in summary, you need to alert them, and this is what NASA has been talking about, of the dangers of this household pollution. You need to inform them what they can do to reduce that pollution. And you need to advise them, but they should be empowered. For example, if you tell me that I have been cooking with firewood inside the house, and that's why I have developed bronchitis. I only have firewood. What can I do to reduce it? So you need to discuss with your patients you encounter. What are the possibilities they have in their home? What can they do? And like I have mentioned, I'm going to mention for the third time, that these exposures, they are not a yes or no. It is dose dependent. Even if people can only manage to start cooking outside instead of indoors, they reduce the dose. If they can change from firewood and crop leaves to charcoal, they reduce the exposure a little bit. If they can change using an improved stove, they reduce the exposure further. If they can go to LPG, then they reduce their dose further. Yeah, and if they can go clean completely, then it is the best. This message uh, can foster a good discussion uh, from the clinical perspective. These are the key things we have for household pollution. We have the best is clean energy electricity or PG. Uh, we have heard about ethanol, clean cook stoves, but most importantly, what people may have immediately could be ventilation. For example, if you allow me one minute, I was seeing an 82-year-old patient uh, earlier this Thursday, uh, earlier this week, who has never had any respiratory problems, but they started two years ago. Through consultation and talking, I learned that actually this lady, two, for many years, she had stopped cooking because there were people in the home. You, you know, in our culture, seniors in the home don't participate in these things. However, in the last two to three years, everyone moved away from Kampala and she's now staying on her own and she started cooking again by herself. And she came down with bad bronchitis. We did lung function, COPD was not there, the heart was normal. So these were recurrent bronchitis from this smoke. So we start to talk, what can she do to, to remove this? in her home. For ambient air pollution, because we have seen, um, uh, let me fast forward, we have seen that actually, the, especially in urban areas, there is an intersect between ambient air pollution and air pollution, and they come together. So when we are exposed to ambient air pollution, there are very many things you can do to reduce it, structural things, cleaning the city, remove old cars, pave roads, do all the things that we know. But at a personal level, you could use respirators, which became very common during uh, COVID-19, but also you can use indoor air filters, which are beyond the scope of Africa. But as we know, as clinicians, if, although everyone cannot afford to seal the house and put filters, probably there could be two, three people who can afford, and you can recommend that. This is uh, our work in Masindi, where we look, we used clean cook stoves, and of course, I'm aware 
I have heard what Professor Dan has talked about. Uh, these stops do not end up with good health benefits. But as you can see here, when we gave people good uh, clean stops, you can see the changes in um, in uh, uh, in exposure values. This is uh, particulate matter two point five. Blue is baseline. Uh, uh, red is uh, uh, first post giving the stop, and 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 two green is the, the second. Of course, this is not randomized. But as you can see in Uganda, there was a tendency to reduce. In Vietnam, of course, they started at a much lower level. You can see Uganda, we started very high, actually, 150. And then uh, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, they also saw some changes. So, 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 so all these efforts to clean the air are important. This, these are respiratory symptoms I have highlighted for Uganda in the same massive study. Although they are not, it did not help a lot. But you can see um, at baseline, in some 30% of the people had respiratory symptoms. It went to 12. Can people see that cough? I know I'm not in slide mode, but this is a message yes. that I really want you yeah. to be. 30.9, which went to 12.7, then it went to zero. You can see wheezing also reduced. Uh, then the symptoms which occurred during cooking. Uh, if people can remember what I told you, there are those things which will stay with you forever, but they are acute effects, yeah? A young girl who has gone to the village for Christmas comes back with red eyes, yeah? That is not good. So things like uh, the acute effects of cough, wheezing, headache, irritated eyes, you can see irritated eyes, of course, need to go from 48 to 15. Um, then uh, nasal congestion from 25 to 6.7. And others, people, if people are interested, can look at this paper. It is published online. But I have to say this is not a randomized trial. These are subjective things. But where we are seated, we really need to see how we can innovate and give people something that can, for lack of any use, at least keep them knowing that they are being helped. So, Chair, I want to, to stop. But the key message in summary is that uh, clinicians we need to start looking at the uh, household air pollution and clean cooking or dirty cooking as risk to health and assess it the way we assess obesity. You come, we measure your weight and height, know your BMI, we take your BP. We should ask you about these exposures. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chiringa. Uh, I know where people are seated. They are giving you and the rest of the speakers a round of applause. So colleagues, uh, I think this is a time where we uh, need to uh, interact with our presenters. And uh, uh, we, should, we can uh, recall that from the first presenter, uh, we looked at the current landscape of household, household air pollution, uh, emphasizing its alarming impact on public health. Uh, environmental consequences of indoor air pollution and the interconnectedness with the broader health challenges that we have. So this presentation looked uh, to highlight the imperative for a transition to clean cooking methods, uh, drawing attention to really tangible steps that uh, communities or individuals could take. Uh, in our quest to address uh, household air pollution, Nancy talked about uh, community-focused strategies that involve arrays of uh, various initiatives. Uh, we know that these uh, really emanate from raising awareness uh, through targeted campaigns uh, and other places where people have been. Uh, but uh, they finally went into customizing messages uh, that have been uh, put out there in a program that is going to teach uh, the communities out there on how to transition from uh, dirty technologies to cleaner technologies. Um, I think the last presenter looked at uh, the clinical problems that are associated with uh, the household air pollution. Uh, illuminating the intricate challenges that are caused by uh, indoor air contaminants that are multiple and not only the burning of the fuels that we have or the cooking using firewood. 
So he meticulously detailed the adverse health effects ranging from uh, respiratory diseases to cardiovascular diseases and particularly pointed out the linking uh, of these exposures uh, that uh, the longer it is, the worse the outcomes. So all these presentations really underscore the urgency of addressing uh, this public health crisis and uh, also really show us the interconnectedness between air quality and uh, clinical outcomes. So colleagues, allow me to open the platform uh, for discussion. So if you have a question, uh, please uh, raise your hand uh, and uh, we will find you. Uh, or if you have a question that you've already put in the comment section, we could address that. Uh, so I'll be looking through uh, the chat to see if there are any questions uh, that are coming through. Uh, so maybe um, uh, I, I could, I, I would want to, to, to start off the discussion with uh, uh, a, few, a few comments or questions. Um, I would have wanted uh, to uh, thank, I would, I would want to thank Professor Pope and, uh, and, and, and uh, for the presentation that you really put out there showing us the current landscape. Um, I, I, I would have wanted you to elaborate a little more on the specific measures or policies that have really proven effective in mitigating household air pollution in different communities. We, we, we know that different communities address uh, household air pollution uh, in, in the context in which they are. But uh, uh, from, your, from your experience, do you really think we could have uh, a, one, a one size for all, or we are going to um, look at something different for Africa, look at something different for Europe, look at something different for elsewhere? Uh, we know that uh, there's a lot that has been discovered. Recently, there's a lot that has been discovered in Africa. Uh, we have a lot of... Uh, petrol that we have, or fuels that we have discovered in certain parts of this country. And so moving on to clean uh, technologies uh, is going to be a bit of a challenge for people that want to first make sure that uh, we benefit the most that we can from our recent discoveries. So I, I, would, I, I, I want to hear your comments on that. And maybe for... Um, um, uh, um, uh, for Nancy, I, I just want to hear your view or your comment on uh, how you think communities can balance uh, economic development with sustainable practices uh, to really address uh, the concerns that you highlighted. So um, I think one of the things that uh, we know some of these clean cook technologies come with is uh, the, the the bites on the pocket. So uh, do you have any suggestions uh, in which on which the communities can actually uh, piggyback on so that there is a bit of uh, economic development uh, with these sustainable practices? So maybe I can stop there and, uh, and, and as other people are coming up with questions, uh, you could uh, look into those two in the meantime. I don't know if the team uh, uh, in the in the control room can hear us. You hear can us? You hear me? I can. Okay, Wait, so I can hear you. Now we get you. you. Fantastic. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you for those two questions. Um, I was just saying in relation to uh, biomass stoves, uh, improved cook stoves. Um, we all know there are a, a whole range of different offerings and different NGOs, different groups promoting uh, improved cook stoves. And you saw our appraisal of the current evidence base for improved cook stoves that showed they didn't reduce um, uh, levels of particulate matter sufficiently to uh, uh, IT1, WHO IT1 levels for health. Um, but improved cook stoves 
perform in different ways. Um, and testing is, is crucial. So we can understand how good those uh, stoves are. In uh, Kenya, for example, Kurdi test stoves and give them a certification if they um, reach uh, tier ratings of emissions and safety and durability. Those ratings need to be taken into consideration when recommending uh, stoves. So the community has promoted that this is part of the training that they receive and, and, and VHT. We understand which are the best stoves to recommend. As Professor Karenga was saying, on the journey to truly emissions uh, are, are useful to reduce exposure, um, although they might not have a significant impact on uh, outcomes. The second question relates to um, options for saving uh, clean uh, energy. And it's a good question, and we, we have a meeting with the uh, Ministry of Energy, Ministry of Health. We've lost you, Prof. I don't options know you are completely implemented in Uganda. Okay. Ah, can you hear me now? Hello? Okay. Let's go ahead. Let's let's see if we can keep up with you right now. Now we can't hear you. Sorry. We cannot hear a thing. I don't know. Zahar, can you hear us? Looks like we've lost you completely. Are other colleagues able to hear, Prof? Sorry, I may be, I don't know if I'm the only one. No, we can't hear them. No, I can't hear. I'm muted. Yeah. Hello, can everyone hear me now? Sorry, we're having all sorts of technical issues and I'm hoping you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you now. Brilliant. Um, I think I got the first point across, but I'll quickly go to the second point, which related to this issue of, of what technologies, uh, clean fuel combinations might be the best approach. Um, we had a meeting today with the Ministry of Energy, Ministry of Health and, and, a, and a technical working group meeting discussing the Ugandan clean cook stove program, which is an integrated strategy drawing from a range or a suite of options, including electricity, LPG, ethanol and biogas. And we were talking about the best combinations. I think it was decided that a, a clean stack would be preferable. So maybe a combination between LPG and uh, electric pressure cooker to meet every, all, everybody's needs. And it's an important point because um, quite often a transition to clean will not mean an exclusive uh, transition to, to clean cooking. So if there's some stacking with polluting fuels, people using LPG continuing to use wood, for example, for, for cooking with beams, the levels of air pollution that um, uh, are reduced will still
is something seriously disturbing the internet today. Sorry, 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 sorry. We cannot, we cannot get you from the control room. I don't know if you're trying to change the host or something, but or the source of the internet, but we are not getting anything. Ivan, we are back on again now, but it keeps coming and going, so it's difficult sorry. to continue. Sorry, sorry. I I I I understand your pain. I can feel your pain, sorry. So I don't know if you still had anything more to add to the discussion. I hope you we, called. Really, we, we couldn't, we, 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 uh, Prof, uh, Prof Daniel, we didn't get much of what you said on the second point. We, okay, we, I'll we just say very briefly. Almost, then, yeah, right, right. Um, so all I was saying was that, uh, that it's a very important point to consider the suite of available options for clean fuels and energy. And in the discussions this morning with the typical working group, um, with the Ministry of Energy and, and Ministry of Health, uh, uh, discussing the National uh, Integrated Clean Cooking Programme for Uganda, um, it was exactly that, you know, what's the best clean stack? Um, is it uh, LPG with some use of L uh, electricity, for example, an electric pressure cooker? Because we want households to fully transition to clean, to get the health benefits that can be achieved um, if there's any... Stacking with polluting, you saw from the uh, the systematic review evidence we showed. So that's what I'm saying. Over. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's really absurd that our internet is having problems at a time when we have important guests in the country. So I hope uh, our smiles have not taken the internet away. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if there are any questions from uh, from the rest of the participants here. I don't seem to see uh, any hands up. I don't seem to see any comments. I guess the inter internet has also interrupted maybe some of uh, the flow of uh, events here. But nonetheless, maybe um, uh, may, may, may I request uh, uh, maybe Prof, since we are coming to 4.30, uh, to give us uh, your parting shots uh, before I could officially close uh, this session. Professor Pop and uh, Professor Chiringa, but maybe Professor Pop, uh, it would be nice for you to give us your parting shots. That's if the internet allows you to. The, inter the internet may fail you, sorry. Ivan, I am here. Um, thank you so much. Allow me to speak to the question you had asked earlier. Okay. This was on how, how are the communities tackling sustainability, sustainability economic empowerment, and uh, matters pocket in terms of investing in clean energy. So one is that uh, whenever community health promoters and workers are communicating the health messaging, they're also able to take the household members through cost comparison, whereby the household members report on what they're currently spending on energy and what will they be spending afterwards. Yes, I do. Uh, we are cognizant of the fact that some households collect their firewood free However, the investment of hospital visits and um, upper respiratory infections that are never going away, in spite use of antibiotics, are also factors to consider whenever making a choice on what 
fuel to transition to. Other than that, uh, we had a meeting with the Ministry of Energy earlier and they mentioned that uh, Ugandans never realized that the, the money they spend on charcoal is actually more expensive than what they do spend in electricity and LPG. So that is a study that has been done within the context. And even though the advantage that comes with the use of charcoal is that you're able to pay in small quantities, but then the long run is what determines how far, which then tends to be very expensive. Lastly, we always seek to utilize the existing structures. And so as much as the women are health educated, there's also an option of financing, which I have seen there is that option here as well, whereby households are given finances or capital to transition, after which they're also given economic empowerment to ensure that there's sustainable use of clean fuels. So the strategies are there, they've been piloted, they've been studied, they've been proven to work, but then we need to customize those strategies to uh, context specific in terms of household specific needs, in terms of energy needs and also family needs, and also to ensure that these households are sustainably using clean fuel so that we avert not just the diseases, but we're also to the pocket in terms of investment in clean energy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy, for um, wrapping that up. I think the internet did you well there around. Um, I don't see any uh, hands or comments that need uh, any particular response. Uh, I think all I'm going to request for, uh, like I did earlier, is uh, for Professor Bob to give us uh, his uh, parting shot in maybe a minute, and then I can uh, close the session. So Professor Bob, over to you. So, Professor Pope, as you're coming up, um, maybe I see uh, the participants are requesting for the CPD link. So, I think this can be provided. Zahara, if you're there, please uh, paste it in the chat. Um, but, uh, Professor Pope, are you able to speak to us now? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah. Um, well, uh, do, you, do you want me to wrap up? Uh, we were wondering whether it was Professor Karenga who was going to be wrapping up, but I'm happy to. Please go ahead. I, I, uh, Professor Chiranga can, 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 can come before you, though, uh, if he has uh, some comments he wants to make before we close this. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Zahara. Uh, unfortunately, because of the interruptions in the internet uh, connections, we have not been able to connect to the UM, UMPDC uh, portal to be able to award CPDs for this particular session, but uh, we shall be making up um, making it up to you next month. So this will come or uh, uh, will be awarded in the next session of the Day of Lung Science, which is next month. We do apologize for the inconvenience. Noted, Zahra. Thank you. Professor Kiringa? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, everyone, for attending the meeting uh, for this uh, important public health program. Have a good afternoon. Okay, thank you. So, so I, I wanted to, to, to just get uh, a, a wrap up statement from Professor Pope. Uh, if uh, it's possible. So, Professor Pope, uh, please go ahead now. Oh, yes, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm really sorry about uh, to everybody about the uh, interruptions we've been having. We've been fighting technology and losing by the looks of things. So, um, thank you all for sticking with the three presentations. We hope you found it interesting. Um, 
we'll be very happy to talk more where, when we've got a better signal. <laughs> and we've got a lot to tell you about the Clean Air Africa program, which is a substantive program of uh, a number of research activities from households to schools to communities. Um, and we'll be delighted to come back and join this series. Uh, I think uh, getting your input and your viewpoints will be very important in the Ugandan context. So on behalf of the speakers, I'd like to thank you very, very much. Um, I hope we can interact in the future. You'll find my email address on the first slide uh, of my presentation. Be very happy to um, respond to any queries you had. And I'd just like to thank the Makerere Lung Institute for hosting us over the last few days. It's been a, a very rewarding experience. And uh, thank you all and see you hopefully in a couple of months time. Bye bye. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Pope. Uh, as we conclude, I, I also want to, uh, on behalf of all the participants, I uh, want to express our gratitude for your time uh, to you all, the presenters, uh, your comprehensive analysis of the current uh, household air pollution landscape really has uh, illuminated the gravity of the situation. So you've left us with uh, insights into uh, valuable considerations for the next uh, phase of our, uh, our generation. I mean, we look at uh, sustainable solutions for our climate and uh, our health at the same time. So collect collectively, you have um, not uh, only left us uh, educated, but you left us uh, in this uh, mode of trying to understand what can we do for the betterment of public health, the environment, and our shared climate. So on behalf of all the participants, thank you very much for sparing your time. And uh, I want to wish you a quiet and nice evening. Thank you very much. See you on the next uh, day of Lung Science. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.